G'day Rachel, as you can imagine it has been a tough few months for my client. So naturally they're super focused on maximising reach with their next campaign. But reach, as I've found out, doesn't always equal impact. So what I want to know is how can I convince them that what they really need right now is to grab the attention of the right customers to get that impact, you know what I mean? I reckon I can help you with that. Cue the music. Welcome to Rethink, a podcast by Think with Google. I'm Rachel Corbett and today's episode is all about attention, something that is even harder to grab when we're all scrolling through socials, binge watching the latest shows, looking up YouTube videos or swiping right on a few potentials. We can be waist deep in distractions without even leaving the couch. So how do you not only get people's attention but keep it? For this, we're bringing in a brand who's done it and done it well. So well, in fact, they even made a sequel for an ad. Hey, it's Humphrey. My brother Darius is choice at everything. He's the best at rugby. He's the best at running in jandals. What's with the cricket bat? He's the best at DJing. The king goes... He's just so chill and confident. He can even talk to girls. Strange behaviour for a Kiwi, you know. That's the opening to the ad for Lynx Australia, featuring Kiwi actor Julian Dennison on his quest to get the confidence to speak to his schoolgirl crush, Rachel Peckham, a story that hooked people in in a way most ads dream of. And to talk us through the thinking behind it, enter Unilever's brand manager, Kate Westgate. We were launching a new body spray called Lynx Australia. And I guess we really wanted to nail the communication for this body variant because it could have gone one of two ways of communicating about Australia. So we'd recently gone through a brand relaunch. We'd gone from the really well-known The Lynx Effect, where you spray the Lynx can and the girls come running, to a more modernised Find Your Magic. And I guess we then wanted to create a campaign around Lynx Australia with our Gen Z guys in mind. We really didn't want to anchor the variant to that kind of typical Australiana, showing like the stereotypical scenarios of barbecues, beaches and stubbies was not our goal. We were going after that Chris Hemsworth-esque aspirational, less cliche, because we knew that our Gen Z audience really wouldn't have been attracted to content that was really cliche. Oh, how can you go wrong with Chris Hemsworth-esque? Hmm. Sorry. So Kate knew they wanted to speak to an audience that needed to be creatively wooed, and that's where Emotive came in, a creative agency from Sydney. Jamie Crick is Emotive's head of distribution and analysis, and he says their first step was to dive deep into exactly what makes Gen Z tick. That's anyone born from 1995 to 2010, if you want to feel old. We looked at how this generation, Gen Z, differs from its predecessors. So, for example, they're more socially conscious and progressive, and they're liberated from hard stereotypes like your nerd or your jock, which makes them generally more accepting of difference. But despite this comfort with non-conformity, confidence is something that is pretty universally aspired to. When you're creating a new innovation or an ad, you need the consumer to be at the heart of everything you do. You need to speak to them in their language and find where they're consuming media. You really need to be obsessed about your consumer. If you want to create long-form content that keeps people around, what are some of the things that you take into consideration? You do have to grab attention in the first few seconds and I think also establish narrative tension because that signals to the audience that something expected might be coming. And then also construct the video so that you're giving the audience emotional peaks throughout the video rather than just building it to a crescendo at the end. I think part of this also is that you have to accept that there's going to be a large part of your audience that isn't actually going to make it all the way through. You're on platforms where the view is voluntary um, and non-interruptive. So making sure your brand is present and contributing to the narrative throughout is really vital. And in this case, the Lynx product itself was central to the narrative which meant that we didn't actually need people to make it all the way to the end frame for the brand to get that value from those views. So you want to get your brand in there early, but in a way that adds to the story rather than turning people off. And once you've got people's eyeballs, you have to work hard to keep them. Do that and you harness the magic of attention. At its most basic, it's that meaningful time spent voluntarily and even better, gladly with content. 
And when you can achieve that, the other indicators tend to follow. So likes or reactions on social media, comments, shares, organic views. And generally that flows through to lower media costs because you've got all of those earned results coming through, which ultimately adds up to brand resonance. And some impressive results. Ready for these watch times? Drum roll, please. So our video was a minute 50 long and our average view duration was a minute 30. And that's across 4 million minutes all up on YouTube alone. For the first time in many years, Lynx Australia became our number one Lynx body spray, which was huge because we've had our number one variant Lynx Africa for over 15 years. Wow. So that was one of the goals and that was achieved. We saw a 10.6% increase in unit sales during the campaign as well. During the launch week of the campaign, we were trending on YouTube. So we were number four trending video and we were the only video that was a branded ad that was trending. Definitely worth the drum roll, right? But it wasn't just the watch times, trending content and sales results that made them realise they were onto a good thing. It was the fact that their ad took on an unexpected life of its own. The biggest surprise was how engrossed with the story of Humphrey and Rachel our audience were. We had parodies of the content from both media such as ABC Comedy and Tom Ballard, as well as our own consumers recreating their own videos. We always brief agencies to come up with content which will go viral, and I'm sure many creatives cringe at that ask, but this campaign truly became viral amongst our audience. Our audience was so engrossed with the campaign that there were calls for a follow-up, which is where we came up with the, our second innovation being Lynx New Zealand. So as you know, this is a complete brand manager's dream for um, the consumer to be asking for an innovation. And consumer's dream of advertisers making ads that don't feel like ads. Something emotive achieved by making the product central to the narrative, but not so central you were like, OK, we get it. It's a story about deodorant. The product played a supporting role to the tale of love that people were invested in, a low-touch approach that Kate says took some convincing. Usually we want the brand to be front and centre ASAP as we know that the attention span is quite low for our consumers. However, when we were going through the story, because Emotive had really nailed who our consumer was, how they consume their media and how we talk to them, we really did take a bit more of a risk allowing them to set up the story and engage our Gen Z audience in. Um, and then they also had... I guess every minute detail of the campaign was thought through to keep the attention and to keep the brand relevant. So I think because we had really known what our Gen Z guys were interested in and what content they were going to share, it allowed us as a brand to take more of a risk. If you guys sort of traditionally do 30 second ads and this was like a big risk for you, has this totally made you change the way you think about the impact that branded content can have? Yeah, I think if you get the story right, you can kind of make the content as long as possible. Like it could go a lot longer than the a minute 30 that we were doing. It all comes down to really nailing the content. Content is king. It's that attempt to be part of entertainment culture rather than just advertising around it. As Kate said, you know, we could have gone longer and we did for the second Lynx New Zealand piece. We were at over three minutes. And it's just because we had the confidence from the first piece that people would stick around and they had somehow invested in these characters after less than two minutes. That was what was so sort of surprisingly magical about it. So creating a story that makes people want something is one thing, but what do you do when everyone's desperate for the thing you've got but there's none left. That's the situation Deadall found itself in this year when hand sanitizer became the must-have product of the moment, something they could never have anticipated in a situation RB Health's marketing director, Henry Turgus, says forced them to rethink. We had a lot of disappointed consumers. Consumers were reaching out to us. We can't find enough Dettol. I really need Dettol and I can't find it. So what we did is we built a campaign, yes, that spoke about instant hand sanitizer, but it spoke about our portfolio and how that trust and the science behind Dettol transcends that portfolio and all of our products. Dettol has been around for 80 years in Australia. So that's where we really, really focused on that brand truth. What were you guys trying to achieve with the Protecting Tomorrow campaign? The objectives of the campaign were really twofold. First of all, we wanted to inspire people and to make people feel empowered 
that actually they do have a role and they do have the ability to protect what matters most to them. We wanted to make consumers feel empowered to act and to protect. And then the second point, when COVID first struck, clearly there was a huge demand for Dettol products. And frankly, that left retailer shelves empty, which meant that from a media perspective, we went really quiet. And you know what was really critical for us as a brand was that we picked up that voice again. And we had a voice and we had a presence during this time of real need and need for hygiene amongst our consumers. And trust becomes even more important when every second person is mixing up tequila in their bathtub trying to cash in on the sanitizer craze. But how do you advertise in a time when the product you're advertising might not be available and you've got competitors coming at you from all sides, including Jan with her bathtub disinfectant? So the core of the campaign is a 60-second video. And that 60-second video demonstrates and shows a selection of scenes which pre-COVID simply would have been a normal weekend life in Australia. The beach, the surfing, spending time with extended family and friends. And really the call to action in the copy it starts off with, make no mistake, we're in a fight and we're in a fight to protect what matters most. What was the thinking behind moving to sort of longer form video and YouTube? Because Dettol can be seen as quite a traditional brand. What was your thought about choosing those platforms? Once we locked down on an idea of, of where we wanted to go with the creative, YouTube immediately became very much a chosen platform for us. The ability to target and the ability to have very clear metrics that simply with other platforms and more traditional media, you don't get all the metrics. So it was a natural choice for us to go to. We needed something to cut through and simply put another 15 second or a a static image just wasn't going to cut through adequately. And we had confidence to pull together a longer form content because we knew that the depth of feeling the depth of emotion amongst consumers, the depth of need for our brand at this time was such that we could grab attention and we could hold attention and we could really, as I said earlier on, really uh, reinforce the trust and the empowerment that they have to protect their loved ones. For me as a marketer, I think attention means capturing somebody and saying something to them that actually really has a meaning and connects with them. I don't know if you've noticed, but we keep coming back to the importance of knowing who your audience is, where they are and what they're doing, or in these COVID times, what they're not doing. And to get more of a handle on that, it's time to bring in the folks at Google. My name's Stuart Pike and I lead Google's consumer and market insights team for Asia Pacific. Stu. We're talking to each other in a very coronavirus way today because we're not in the same room. Where are you coming to us from right now? Not only are we not in the same room, we're we're essentially not in the same hemisphere. I'm coming to you from my apartment in Singapore. And so, look, I'll apologise to everybody if it's all a little bit grainy, but that's merely a result of me having to do this from a bedroom in a Singapore condominium. Yeah, that sounds nice. I'm in a cupboard. Stu is on the line to talk us through why attention is a marketer's bread and butter and where you're most likely to grab it. We've actually found that there are some really interesting environments that seem to be conducive to greater attention. So this is not necessarily a knock on that living room environment, but there are distractions there. And so one of the things that we found in a recent project was that there are these out of home pockets of activity. And a perfect example I would I would give to you would be sitting on the train pre-coronavirus and we we're all commuting to work. Examples like that from our research have actually shown that it's a much greater job of capturing people's attention when you know you say you know you've got 40 minutes until your train stop luckily you have found a seat on the train you can sit down there and then just immerse yourself you've got the headphones on whatever phone you've got and you just immerse in that content that is actually the highest attention score that we've seen but what if you're no longer doing the commute what's the best way to capture people's attention in their pjs i mean their casual work attire Google's unskippable labs, they've done a a ton of research focused on on YouTube, for instance, looking at what are the drivers for really grabbing attention from an advertising perspective. And so some of the big things that they've come out with, we know really, really work is 
you know, it's essential you grab people's attention in the first few seconds. The concept we use internally is serve dessert first. Like if you've got a big eye-catching grab or something really exciting, try and get it up front. And then, you know, to maintain attention through the rest of your ad, you've got to have some unexpected shifts. You've got to have other peaks throughout. So don't go waiting for the big crescendo at the end. Give people exciting bits all the way through and make them feel like they're choosing to watch your content, not like you forced it on them. I think consumer choice is something that's not being used very widely yet, but we've seen lots of evidence that it is very, very powerful. And the hypothesis basically is that if we choose to view something rather than having it forced upon us, we pay a lot more attention to it. We've seen similar findings out of a number of different pieces of research. There was a great piece of research done in the UK that showed that 71% of videos that were actively selected had one investment signal present compared to just 33% of the passively consumed videos, which is a powerful data point sort of supporting this notion of consumer choice being a driver of effectiveness. And Stu's also got some very interesting thoughts about reach, everyone's favourite metric, and why it might not be the smartest one to focus on. We buy and sell based on reach, but reach is really just the opportunity for getting attention. It's not really the driver of a successful advertising campaign. I think as an industry, we need to focus a lot more on attention And this is going to sound awfully like it's a a Google infomercial, so I'll apologise to anybody who's still listening in advance. But (laughs) one of the things we've chosen to do on YouTube is allow people to skip an ad. So six seconds into an ad, finding it boring, it's not relevant, click the skip button. The advertiser doesn't pay, so they're quite happy to have a skippable format. What we find is not only is it it useful for understanding what people are interested in and what they're not interested in, but we can tangibly measure just how much attention people focus to those ads when they haven't decided to hit the skip button. And it is significantly greater. And so I think this concept of giving consumers a degree of choice in what ads they watch, it's not necessarily practical in every medium, but where it is, It's also another thing that's going to drive increased attention and thus increased success for the advertiser. People don't hate ads. People hate irrelevant and bad ads. Amen. Don't give people bad ads. We've got enough on our plate without being bored to death by crummy content. So think about all of the distractions that people have available and how easy it is not to pay attention if your content doesn't draw them in. Don't be afraid to let your product play a supporting role in a narrative that makes people feel like they're getting something seriously valuable from your content, whether that's laughter, a warm, fuzzy feeling, or advice on how to talk to their schoolyard crush. If you're serving up content that's so good people choose to watch it, you'll have those eyeballs flocking like you just covered yourself in a cloud of links. Why wasn't I anyone's high school crush? That's a whole other podcast. You've been listening to Rethink, a podcast by Think with Google. I have been your host uh, and lonely woman, Rachel Corbett. Don't forget to hit subscribe, share the show with your friends, and if you're feeling lovely, leave us a little five-star review. This podcast was brought to you by Think with Google. It was created by The Hallway and Eardrum in partnership with Google and produced by Eardrum. The executive producer was Ralph Van Dyke. Producer was Sarah Mashman. Project manager is Jesse Williams. The theme was Rethought by Tucker Perry and the engineer was Adrian Walton. This podcast was recorded on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation.